why don't we go ahead and call the meeting to order um, the Fairfield Board of Health, um, July 12, 2021 meeting at 7.33. Um, hopefully everyone had a chance to take a look at the minutes uh, that Sansa sent out earlier. Um, does anyone have any comments, questions, edits? Uh, if not, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? So we'd be, we'd be oh, I'm sorry, for two, two, two months worth of minutes. For May and June. Yeah. Because um, last meeting was sort of an informational meeting. Um, so. I missed that one. Sorry about that. Sorry, yeah. right, I did. <laughs> we had a board that meeting. That's okay. Oh. So, do I, do, does it have to be two separate motions for May and for June? No, you can do it together. Fantastic. So if I can get a motion to approve the meeting, uh, the minutes from the May and June meetings. All right. Give me a second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Uh, moving on to the Director of Health. Sure. So, um, currently, right now, we've, we're up to uh, 5,269 cases with 207 deaths. Um, are in Fairfield. Our cases have been uh, relatively light. Uh, we've had a couple interesting, you know, uh, cases of uh, three in one week of breakthrough cases, uh, and of people who got actually, or two of them got very sick. Um, but um, so right now we've uh, wrapped up our vaccination efforts on uh, July 1st. We did our last clinic, uh, and for the last, uh, since June 4th, we've been doing smaller office-based ones. And so we did a, a total of uh, 25,322 vaccinations um, uh, since um, December 23rd. Um, so uh, today we had some CDC updates today and on Friday we had some CDC updates on how it's going sort of the national perspective. Um, they are sort of indicating that cases are, you know, seven day, uh, week over week average, they saw about a 30% increase from seven days ago in cases. Uh, they saw uh, it's a 50% increase over case, in cases over June 20th. Um, and a 15% increase in hospitalizations in the last seven days. So they're saying that, you know, essentially alluding to that, the, you know, Delta variant is, is here in the United States and it's, it's having an impact. The, this impact is being felt predominantly in um, areas with lower vaccination rates. And so that's, you know, we're pretty good in that regard. Um, some of the, I'll go into some of our vaccination rates uh, for the town on a whole, and this is updated as of, it's 7-7 seven, seven data, but it's updated last Friday. The town of Fairfield has 62% uh, uh, that are fully vaccinated uh, and 67% that have initiated vaccination. And so that's using as the, deno the denominator the full population. If you take out the uh, 9,600 that are under 12, um, it really gets our number up to 74%. And that's the number, like when you see the state say, hey, we're, we're in the 70s for both of our, you know, um, uh, for, for our age groups, that's really what they're looking at um, is that number where they're sort of taking out those who aren't eligible yet. Uh, if you look at different age groups, you have the breakdown of age groups. Uh, so the 12 to 15, we have... Uh, essentially 54% fully vaccinated um, with 61% or 62 initiating vaccination. For 16 to 44, we've got 62% or 63, excuse me, that are fully vaccinated with 69% initiating. Uh, for 45 to 64, we have 82% uh, fully vaccinated with 89, uh, 88%, excuse me, uh, that have initiated. And then for our 65 and olders, it's 92% fully vaccinated and 96% initiated. So it's good to see the difference between initiated. You know, usually most of those will come over and, you know, and we, but the numbers are creeping up very slowly week over week. Um, 
in some of these age groups. You know, we'd really like to see this, these younger age groups, um, you know, where the, it's been available for some time now um, to get those percentages up. Um, so we're lo working at some uh, social media um, advertising and, and trying to uh, generate interest in, you know, if, if with the concept of if your plan is to, you know, get them vaccinated before school and you're waiting for that, okay. You know, you're trying to want to go on vacation and have your kid maybe be sick for a day or two, and you don't, you know, but to, to say now's the time to start it. I you know? feel like it's plateaued because the people that want, wanted to get the vaccine have initiated, yeah. and those that have not, are not planning to because mm -hmm. they're doubtful or fearful or need yeah. more education. So I think that we need to you know, target them to convince them. Yep. I'm, that's what I'm finding at work a lot, doing a lot of notes, and they're really like yeah. adamant about it. Adamant yeah. Yep. yeah, I was going to say that I think it's, well, I think that just comes down to the whole risk benefit, you know, analysis where some people are just looking at, okay, you they're know, I mean. looking at, they're just, they're just kind of coming. Well, I'll tell you, I went, I had my, my 16 year old vaccinated um, the first one just the other day because he had had COVID in April, and I honestly didn't want to vaccinate him right after he just had COVID because he already had the antibodies. So it was like, but he has to fly to Ireland in August for a competition. And so it was just a situation where it was like trying to figure out. And of course, right when he looked it up, what's the first thing that came up was last week, the 13 year old who died three days after mm -hmm. vaccination in New Jersey. So he was not, he actually didn't want it. He was like very reticent then mm -hmm. because of that. So. I mean, I think there is some reticence kind of for a reason where his, he had already had COVID and recovered and, you know, so I could see why some people might feel yep. that way. That's just no, there's a lot of people that are reluctant to get it uh, and, you know, and, but I think there's also from, you know, what I've heard from people is just they're waiting. They're still kind of waiting to see. There's a little bit of that still going on. So that's really, I mean, we're never going to reach the people who don't want to get it. So like, that's okay. Uh, I'd like to see the numbers higher. I mean, I think we all would. Um, but those who are still considering it, uh, one of the, a survey I saw recently said, you know, a lot of people are still kind of waiting. And, you know, just to get people in the mindset of, you know, if, if the plan is before you go back to school, college or, or, or grade school, that now's the time to start because, you know, got, if you're going to get the Moderna you know, or the Pfizer, it's now and then three or four weeks later and then two weeks before you're done and then it's you know if you're wanting to do if you're planning to do all the activities you wanted to do um, uh, and be vaccinated so you can do it with less restrictions and exempt from quarantine and all those things that now's the time to start and so we're going to be trying to push out some messaging related to that um, okay. one yeah. I've heard that some parents were just waiting if they thought there was a booster like, let me put off the first dose and do it as close to school as possible because that'll just push when I possibly need a booster and maybe I won't need the yeah. booster. So yeah. that was another thing that maybe is delaying some people even getting the first dose. So an another one of the CDC guidance uh, documents that came out, their new guidance for K through 12 schools and uh, preschool um, uh, came out. Uh, essentially, the biggest change is if you're fully vaccinated, there's no max mask requirements. Um, and so, but it's essentially saying that if you're unvaccinated, you still have to wear a mask uh, inside the school. Uh, so outside the school, they kind of downplayed that and said you really don't need to wear a mask outside. Uh, but if you're unvaccinated, you'll still have to wear a mask. So that's a, that's a big change. Um, um, uh, can we ask questions now, or do you want to after? It's fine with me. That's fine. It, it, yeah. If you if you're okay with that. Yeah. Um, so on that point, what are your thoughts on the fact that there are other neighboring states who have already announced that they wouldn't have, you know, the mask requirement? And then secondly, the second question of that is the segregation issue of kids in the schools, um, which is going to be, I would think, problematic given the risk, again, back to like the risk piece, um, sure. you know, that the whole messaging yep. initially that came out was that this was for protecting the vulnerable po population, the older population. This was about the kids doing that for them. But now that all of those people have had the opportunity to be vaccinated and make that choice, I mean, these are just the 
I'm just saying all the questions that I'm seeing circling yep. um, and concerns. Um, so there's a couple things that regarding, you know, the laws of it. So uh, <coughs> the state is uh, going to be coming out with their own guidance uh, probably within a week or so. Uh, we've got a, a call scheduled next Tuesday with SDE, the superintendents and health departments. Well, those aren't those aren't laws, though, right? Those well, are we'll recommendations. Wait we'll wait and see. You know, so mm -hmm. so there's two things that are coming up: is that what, however, the state puts out their guidance, mm -hmm. and then uh, the current executive order for the governor expires, I think, on the 21st, and that you know essentially grants the authority to SDE to set policies related to the uh, and gives them related to masks in schools and gives them the authority to, as, a, as the force of law. Um, that's what it currently is. So we'll wait and see um, that, how that plays out. So I, I, I did hear that the uh, legislature is going back in session to discuss this issue, and so it may come out as some form of law through them. So, but we'll wait and see. That's what we have to kind of wait and see how that's going to play out. Um, if there's a law that says it's required, then it's a law that says it's required. If not, then it'll be it'll be guidance, and there'll be discussions in terms of what direction we'll go. So, um, so um, just following up, we talked about the vaccinated uh, percentages. Uh, I did want to follow up on. I didn't mention that uh, some of the increases. They also see, saw the test positivity, uh, detailed test positivity going up. Uh, about 8% in seven dis different uh, jurisdictions. Now, they didn't explain exactly what they meant with jurisdictions. I'm sort of wondering <clears throat> if they mean states or our large municipal areas. Um, they sometimes interchangeably use those words. So, but they talked about, you know, test positivity starting to go up as well. Um, so, um, the other change that they did, which I think is, is a, a, a lessening of the restrictions on um, kids being in school is that they uh, put in place an exemption on um, the definition of close contacts for K-12 schools as being, uh, if it's greater than uh, three feet, then you don't have to quarantine. So essentially, if there's a case in the school and the kids are, you know, greater than three feet apart, uh, then quarantine is not required. So. Currently, it's you can sit three feet apart, but if, if somebody's a positive case, typically the kids sitting around them would have to quarantine, and then anyone else who is defined as a close contact. If they're not vaccinated. If they're not vaccinated, yeah. So anybody who's vaccinated in the schools is exempt from quarantine. Yep. So um, that's, that's a big change. So that'll help with, you know, keeping kids in school, and that'll help with contact tracing, and it'll, uh, you know, I think it's a, a, a good step forward. Um, so moving on from uh, some of the COVID-related issues. Um, I guess one more question. Sure. Um, and, but still masks on buses, though, correct? Public transportation? For now, uh, for but for school buses, too, waiting for now until July 20th, and then we'll find out afterwards. Yeah, I mean, the jet, yeah, so... You know the general guidance. We're waiting. You know, whether it's the CDC one coming out, yeah. and there'll be the state one, and then there's the July 20th decision, and that'll determine. You know, uh, you know, essentially how we move forward. Okay. Um, so we've been. Uh, you know, the health department's getting back involved in the fill use issues. Um, so we're um, moving forward with that. We've had a couple meetings about that uh, in the past month. Um, we're moving forward with several remediations. Uh, some are underway, some are actually completed, um, and some are scheduled to start soon. So we're really, you know, of the um, seven sites that we are going to do an extensive remediation, we're, we're completed a couple of them, like Wigan is done, Southport Beach is done, other than backfilling with clean material, but everything was done there. There's a couple others that we're working on. Um, Osborne Hill School, all the material's been removed, and they're, I, I haven't been by to see if they backfilled it yet, but they're, all they have to do is put in clean material now. Um, and so, uh, and then we have got a couple other um, projects that are just about to start um, um, with their uh, remediation. So 
it's a good thing moving forward with that. Um, we did participate in a regional um, hot wash for uh, COVID with uh, our Region 1 partners. This part of, this part of Connecticut, uh, Greenwich to Stratford and as high as the uh, sort of eastern uh, area. Um, so uh, just to sort of come up with what, what can we do better uh, next time, you know, if there's another wave. So that will come out, uh, the comments of that will come out in an after action report that we'll take back and use it to uh, improve our plans. Um, we continue to work on our grants. There's, there's uh, you know, right now, at the end of the fiscal year, we're doing expenditure reports and progress reports and then completing applications for next year's uh, uh, grants. Uh, we did get, uh, just notified last Friday, uh, the per capita grant uh, had an increase of 75%, 75 cents per head. So that gives us, we go up from, you know, about $65,000 up to uh, nearly $120,000. Uh, so that'll give us some more staffing capacity. Um, and we're still waiting to see on the epidemiology, epidemiology and laboratory capacity grant number two. There's a ELC one that we're in the second budget period of. Then there's a whole other pot of money, ELC two, uh, which we're waiting to hear. That should be, you know, they've said in a similar range of dollars, which you know for ELC one was about two hundred fifty uh, three thousand. No. Uh, yeah, $253,000. So we may get another pool of money uh, with that ELC2, but we're waiting to see sort of what the, what the expectations are of, uh, of accepting that money. Um, so we'll continue to work, wait on that, but we're continuing in the meantime to work, work on the reports and expenditure reports. Um, we did have an interesting case with the Board of Condemnation uh, where we had issued a citation to a particular property that had stockpiled, it was a residential property, they had stockpiled commercial materials there um, with this plan some point in the future of becoming a farm or a ranch. And so this was materials, you know, like it was actually um, the old, when they redid the railings on the Merritt Parkway, they had these like 10 by 10 pieces of wood. I remember, yeah. Somebody uh -huh. bought all those, and uh -huh. the plan was to make it into a very heavy duty post and beam fence uh -huh. around this proposed ranch and farm. So, you know, but in the meanwhile, it's big piles of like material <laughs> stockpiled, <laughs> huge amounts stockpiled on this residential yard up in the north mm -hmm. part of town. And uh, so we had the Board of Condemnation had issued. Uh, a notice of violation, uh, a notice of determination to them, asked them to clean it up, um, and he uh, and then we he, he he did not do so. So uh, the owner we issued a citation. It's a fine of $100 a day, and he appealed the citation. And the hearing officer actually upheld his appeal, indicating it's not really meets the definition of garbage and mm -hmm. trash on the property, uh, but that mostly because zoning had already issued an order for them to clean up the property and so he said, well, the zoning order is more appropriate so we're going to we're going to vacate your citation and uphold the zoning order. So, um, which was, you know, was the first time we've lost a citation appeal hearing, uh, but it was okay because by the end of the week, the zoning director had sent me pictures of, you know, several piles were already gone and removed and materials are gone. So, so he's improving the property and the neighbors are, are happy about it. So, but an interesting case for us. Um, we did have an initial planning meeting for our community health assessment, community health improvement plan. Once again, we'll be working with our, uh, what's called Health Improvement Alliance, which is all the local hospitals, um, healthcare facilities, health departments work together to fund a, this uh, assessment of the uh, uh, community health assessment. Um, and we'll utilize uh, a company called Data Haven out of New Haven that does um, statewide um, well-being survey, they call it. You know, but basically they ask the questions that we put in there and, uh, and so we've been using them for I think three times now. So it's a good consistent data set um, over time. And so, uh, but we have the initial planning meetings where we're gonna get started with our Surveying should start um, 
this fall, actually. So we'll get going on that, and that'll lead to that feeds back into our strategic plan. And you know, as once we finish that, it'll still be about really another another at least a year before we get the final part of that, where we'll develop a health improvement plan, and those priorities will work its way back into our strategic plan. And then uh, just uh, we did have some beach closures, or we currently have some closures uh, this weekend due to the rainfall on. Thursday night into Friday, we got over five inches of rain in, in Fairfield, and so we had to close the uh, coastal beaches for the entire weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then we're keeping the lake closed for an additional um, additional three days or two days right now, but we're actually getting, we had samples taken today, so we'll get results tomorrow. Fairly confident that the, the the coastal beaches recover quicker because of the tidal action, um, but the lake we're on sh really unclear because it's it's you just never know. You know we've had we had eight inches of rain in one one time period and that led to about a week closure, um, uh, but that was over you know a different period of time. This was uh, you know this is all within 20 hours and so those kind of inundation events it's really somewhat unpredictable on how it's going to impact. So we'll wait and see what our results uh, are tomorrow. Uh, if they're elevated, we'll just keep the lake closed and we'll resample on uh, Wednesday. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. What's the signage look like at the beach when it's closed? On the back of the lifeguard chairs, there's there, signs. Yeah, there's a lot of like comments on the Mom of Fairfield. Like, it was yeah, like complain it. fest. I'm like, well, up to the house, but like I didn't know what he wanted, but like you know, yeah. there's just a lot of like. Made me laugh because it was Anthony's wedding. I was, and everybody's tagging him. I'm like, can you not tag him no. on the day? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, Classic. it's it's you know, over the years we've tried lots of things, but it's it's the beach signs on the back of the lifeguard chairs, fold down every single and one, says, and it says for, okay. no swimming for, swimming. for mm -hmm. health department. Yeah. Is there anything? I saw people clamming after the. Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Is it the weekend? Add a little. Usually, usually the, extra flavor. Yeah. the uh, state's bureau of aquaculture will close down beds. We said close, and there were people out doing it anyway. And I mean, I yeah. wouldn't even, even think that that's. <laughs> well, it's not the best. The, the issue is this: is that I mean. You know, some people, it's fine to sit on the beach, right? So it's not like yeah. you want to close the entrance areas, but then when you yeah. get there, it's such a vast area. It's not like you could gate mm -hmm. off the whole thing. And I, one of our friends is a lifeguard. I, I know he said sometimes there's a, like a skeleton crew, he says, but I don't, I don't know how many are around. So but. Typically, they keep a crew there just yeah. to tell people, don't go in the water. There's yeah. signs mm -hmm. there. Uh, but we did have a conversation with the First Lifeguard's office, mm -hmm. apparently that... So that, that made it up to there and so talked about getting some additional um, At on so sign. Like, on you know how they have those small signs? Yeah. No, they have like those small sandwich board signs. And <laughs> yep, so we're, we're talked about getting some additional signage if that's what people want. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the political type of, you know, yard signs typically get, people take them, okay, yeah, you know, yeah. or, or they blow away and so. You know, so we'll we'll try some additional signage if that's what people want. You could see maybe as you get over like the J one or J two if there was a sandwich yeah. board there. Or that's what they're there, but even just you know, it should really just be at the entrance. Yeah, you know, yeah. Right. swimming clothes. Well, you, you know, that's true. Yeah, that's you know that should take care of it. Um, so especially for like out of towners that drive yeah. here, they want to come to a nice right. Fairfield Beach right. and they want to pay the money and then they right. realize you know it should be there before they even right. get right. in. Right. Right. So, but yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, like. I, none of us like closing down the beaches, oh. but it's we're trying to, you know, be safe and so yeah. prevent illnesses and uh, so. But uh, yeah, to close down yeah, for an entire week. Yeah. 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 So, but that is my report. Great, thank you. Uh, anyone have, have any additional questions? For me? Okay. If not, Jill. Sure. <laughs> Uh, pretty quiet month now that school has started, but last week uh, the summer school started up when we were at five different locations and um, pretty smooth running. They have the uh, three um, extended, year, uh, extended school year special ed programs and then two of the other programs, the boost programs for elementary and secondary schools. And they're kind of, I guess they're similar to the early literacy programs of the past, but it, it, it's beyond that uh, curriculum and um, very well attended. I was over at one of the schools this morning. It's 
very busy. Um, they closed on Friday, though, on account of the weather as well. So, yeah. um, I'm happy to report there have been no cases of COVID in any of the schools. As a matter of fact, I don't think we've had a case under 18 in weeks. Absolutely. Well, I mean, maybe even a month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? We're knocking on wood. <laughs> <laughs> um, part of it, and I think I mentioned it at the meeting last week, we were um, pursuing uh, testing options, either for screening or symptomatic testing. I was going for the screening testing. I uh, just got word on Thursday that the state is not going to support that um, through the grant that we had talked about, but that if we were interested in having it done, you know, through a particular vendor, we could do that. But I, I don't think we're going to pursue that particularly. Um, SANS had given me some information from the CDC, the recommendations as far as when we should be testing in the schools. And our numbers are so low that it would not be recommended at this point. So we have a hold on that. Um, the other um, issue is that we've had some new hires, which I'm happy to announce. Uh, but sadly, we also had a retirement. Mary Ellen Dragosevich, who uh, was our part-time public health nurse out of my office, and fans will attest to this, she organized, planned, implemented, evaluated everything about the um, COVID vaccination clinics. Um, but she decided to step down after, after this year. So I have a pile like this of um, applications that we have to go through. So I'm sure we'll find someone very good. And that's really it. Great. Great. Any yeah. questions for Jill? Great. Uh, Sam, any communication? I have done. All right. Do I? Uh, old business, anyone? All right, new business. I think it's just mine. Yep. It's, uh, uh, sort of give us the background. Yeah, sure. The, uh, so, um, and I'm sorry. Thing. I'm sorry, Joe. Before you, so, yeah. um, do does the board have to take action on that? The board of ed already did take action on okay. it. And this is the way it usually goes, Henry. Okay. You know, they, they it, it's kind of uh, a policy that applies to, you know, health department types of issues, right. but the board of ed generally does the um, change first and the vote and all that. And, but, you know, they're terrific. They right. would always include me yeah. in on that. But it's really um, what we do here in, in this meeting would be to update the policy that we have adopted, you know, years ago, um, you know, to make it reflect these changes in, right. the, in the change in immunization. And, now, and those policies guide the health department staff. That's so right. This, this yeah. is the policies for the health department staff, the school nursing staff to follow. Um, what we have had in the past, and I, I tried to get you, the, you know, I really do like the way that the Board of Ed does it because they'll give like the new and the old and then they number the pages in the upper corner there. Um, so what we have here is our policy on health assessments and our policy on immunizations. And what the um, Board of Ed did, I think it was two years ago, oh no, maybe longer than that. They've combined both into their own, uh, uh, to one policy, both health uh, assessments and immunizations. And um, it was very helpful last year to have that done because they, they did a, a number of changes related to COVID and uh, nobody could get to a doctor. So they, you know, extended the time period or, you know, really gave a lot of allowances as far as timing of the health assessment. So, Health assessments really hasn't changed. It's just that they've eliminated, as you can see where I've blacked it out there, all those um, COVID um, adaptations. So those are gone now. They were only in effect, I think, until June 30th of this year anyway. So th those are just eliminated. Uh, the big thing was that um, on, I remember the day, April 28th, the governor signed the bill uh, banning religious exemptions. And there are some, you know, little subtleties that go along with that. And we just tried to, um, first of all, put the two policies together, both immunizations and health assessments. And then if you see on page five, um, they really do start talking about um, the uh, religious exemption ban. So there still is a religious exemption in effect. If you had one on record, um, and you, your child was a K student, uh, registered for K for 21-22 as of April 28th, and if you had a valid uh, religious exemption on file 
as of April 27th, those are still valid and they will be valid for those children until they graduate um, you know, at the 12th grade. Um, however, if you did not meet, if you have a child going into kindergarten next year and you did not meet either one of those conditions, you didn't have it on record or you didn't have your child registered for K in 21-22, uh, you're ineligible for the religious exemption. Um, so that is one point. I mean, if we just get that point across, <laughs> I think, then I think you'll, you know, understand the rest of it. It really does follow. Other kinds of changes that they brought into it was that um, prior to this, when children went into seventh grade, because they have to get their new seventh grade vaccines, um, they would need to submit another religious exemption. That's been eliminated. Uh, they no longer need to do that. The one that they have on record from whatever kindergarten or third grade or fifth grade or whenever they find it, that will be valid for the rest of their time in school. Um, children who are in pre-K-3 coming in September, um, I'm sorry, coming in, were in pre-K-3 this year, are in pre-K-4, they will have a year to get themselves fully vaccinated, but it is absolutely going away come fall of 2002. So really those are the only points that, that are in there. Um, if you want to read through it a little bit, um, oh, the last point, transfer students. Um, if you transfer within the state of Connecticut and you had a valid uh, religious exemption on file, um, that, will, that will be transferred over to whatever district you happen to go to. This is for public and private schools. Uh, if you had a religious exemption from another state and you transferred into Connecticut, that will not be valid. Um, so it's kind of a stumbling block. Okay. I have one question related to that, and this ties into you with Board of Ed stuff, is um, have, they, have you analyzed the numbers as far as what the ex expected enrollment was and like maybe a slight change? Because I did read some statistics that just overall in the U.S. the public school enrollment has actually declined pretty significantly because of... Because of this issue? Um, yes, because of people pulling out public school? I'm just like, because well, it's, of... It's effective in both private and public <coughs> schools, religious and non-religious schools. I mean, if they homeschooled, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. we'd see an uptick in that, but I'm not aware of that. I'm just yeah, curious I'm what you... Not seeing, um, you know, hearing a lot of people not registering for public school because of this. Yeah, I'm just curious. Well, I definitely know a lot of people who didn't, but... Um, <laughs> and they're I'm, homeschooling? Yeah, either homeschooling or some of the... Or there's some schools that announced in advance, like, uh, no, you know, that they wouldn't have masks or, you know what I mean? That's not allowed. Differentiation. That's, that's against the law. Well, it's not a law. It's a recommendation. No, so, not a law. No, not, not the, you're talking about the vaccination. No, no, I'm talking about the religious exemption. I'm sorry. Right, in that part, yeah. And I was just saying, for example, <clears throat> I know that the, um, with, the, with the masking, there are some things where people didn't, aren't going because they chose a school that already announced that they wouldn't have masking to differentiate between whether somebody is vaccinated or unvaccinated. You see what I mean? Not the religious mm -hmm. exemption. Okay, no. But I'm just saying that I know there's like some, I'll, I'll have to pull the statistic on it. I'm just curious because Fairfield would have had all of the, um, you know, from when the consultants, McBroom and, Whatever well, we're gonna, yeah, I mean, a lot's changed with the demographic just with people moving in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, I'm just curious what the changes are and, and if there are changes. Kindergarten, you know, mm -hmm. we're still in the midst of, we take kindergarten registration until oh, yeah. school, so it's really hard to know. Yeah, it's um, true. People usually wait until the last minute on that, too, it seems. And there was a lot of talk about, oh, people are leaving public school over the past year, and that really wasn't the case. We were seeing, actually, increases. Coming in well, I think that was from the moves from New York City, the, but there were a lot of people. I mean, I know like were 20 families who left, so to private. Okay, I'm just no, I'm just curious. So it was analyzed, like there was a full data analysis on that. Um, I've always, I think I ask this question every time this policy comes up, and mm -hmm. my my memory fails me every time, so I'm going to ask it anyway. Go ahead, Henry. So, the, um, is a, is a, for the, for the TB, does it have to be a skin test? 
do we not take IGRAs for oh, proof of? Do you, do you not take? I'm sorry, what? The IGRA, the um. Oh, the, the quantiferon. Yeah, the quantiferon. Oh, sure. I'm sorry, quantiferon. Yeah, uh, sure. Quantiferon? We can take that. Okay, because the policy only refers to the skin test. I think that. Um, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Oh, that's a good. That's a really good thing. Then we see, would I knew it. if I yeah. brought it up year after year, eventually. Yeah. Someone's like, hey, wait a minute. You got nowhere with Mary Jo and Joanne. Right. So I'm just like, okay, let's try this again. Yeah. Let me see. Just in case you didn't think I read it either, just. Yeah. <laughs> So it, it talks about. Um, All right, you're very the second paragraph there. Any student determined to be at high risk yeah. shall receive a man two uh, tuberculin skin test. Mm -hmm. And the next. So that you could we could change that to. Um, well, I mean, you know, you could have a chest X-ray too. Yeah. yeah. So. But I think the school required. I think the blue form requires the right the screening. The screening of some sort. Yeah, for two They need a, 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 a risk assessment. Assessment, right. yeah. assessment yeah. of their risk. Right, and if they're way. high risk, then some sort of screening. Yeah. There was only indicated if there was a previously positive CPD. Oh, um, no, but people would go get them. I've had people go get a chest X, get a chest X-ray instead of going to get a blood test, and somebody writes the order for that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Certainly, if they're previously positive, yeah. Right, if they're previously yeah. positive. Yeah. That's so perhaps, just for consideration, the next iteration might include um, broadening the scope to include the serum screening for, for the quantiferon. Woohoo, fine. <laughs> other than that, I have no other comments. Anyone else have any comments or questions? All right. Well, that's an interesting point. Would we need to? Um, do so it, it would have to go back. It would have to go back to them first. We just <laughs> couldn't do it for our policy, own. Right. <laughs> yeah. Making more work for everyone. <laughs> Sorry. I can yeah, earn my here. It's important. <laughs> Jennifer well, will not want to hear that. <laughs> well, that's why I would have thought that, that before it goes to the policy, I've always thought that it should go through our board first, but it never does. Right. Yeah, that is, yeah, half the medical professional review, right? Mm -hmm. That test is available now commercially, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody Yeah, everybody And actually, I believe, let me check, um, it, is the, it is the test of choice in patients who've had BCG or mm -hmm. younger, than, right. younger than two, I think. So. <coughs> we can have this go back to the board to change it. And we're going to be doing a private meeting in August where it was just for the COVID policy, the ones that we hopefully right. need. We okay, need I'll talk to Jennifer about we need to add this. Let me talk to Dr. McDonald about it too, see, yeah, see, to see what the language should be. So we're going to table, table this for now. Well, uh, that's why I was asking. We don't we don't have to take any action on this, correct? This was just this was a uh, this is not our policy. This is the board of ed policy. That's that's right. But we do it to provide guidance for our staff. We always do. Right. So I mean, we don't need to update right. this policy. This is the current. This yeah. is the new. So as it stands, it is appropriate, right? It, the thought would be just to expand or amend, right? Can you approve it? I would like to approve it and get it, it on record. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would say just approve it, right? And then if another version comes, yeah. you know. You could do that. Then, new iteration. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then I would really want to get something on the record about it. Yeah. yeah. I think that makes sense. So if it's I can... It's a real hot button. Yeah. But Dr. Yoon, I promise you, the next time I talk about it, And I'll talk to no, Jennifer we, about we, that. We just voted on this. So we okay. Can bring it back to update it now. Well, okay. Fresh and, but, but this is still more updated and current than whatever was there. Right, so therefore, right. it's better to have in place. Right. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, okay. Great. We were really looking at the religious exemption. We yeah, exactly, and the yeah, changes of the... a lot of the other language in there we didn't even... But Dr. Jung goes, has a, you have a history, I think, of going through things that I present and... Just for fun. Going <laughs> really through it. <laughs> just, just for fun. Okay, so if I can get a motion to accept or approve this, um, the updated policy on health assessment and immunization from July 9th, 2021. Can I get a motion, please? Thank you. A second? Great, fantastic. All Thank those you. in favor? Who is the uh, first? I'm sorry. Me. Oh, Sally. Sally, and then, and then Mark. Okay. All right. So all those in favor? Uh, great. Opposed? Fantastic. Motion passes. Um, Thank you. That's all I had. So if we can just get a motion to adjourn, please. Anyone? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Meeting adjourned at 8. 14.